Generators floodlit the temple, a scene of ghastly devastation. Bodies lay exposed, limbs strewn at hideous angles. Each king was decapitated, each privileged neck sliced by diamond-edged handsaws, their proud torsos dismembered by chainsaws, line drilling and wire cutting. The wide stone foreheads were reinforced by steel bars and a mortar of epoxy resin. Avery watched men vanish in the fold of a regal ear, lose a shoe in a royal nostril, fall asleep in the shade of an imperial pout. The laborers worked for eight hours, dividing the day into three shifts. At night, Avery sat on the deck of the houseboat and recalculated the increasing tension in the remaining rock, reevaluated the wisdom of each cut, the zones of weakness and new stress forces, as ton by ton the temple disappeared. Even in his bed on the river, he saw the severed heads, the limbless minions, stacked and neatly numbered in the floodlights, awaiting transport. One thousand and forty-two sandstone blocks, the smallest weighing twenty tons. The miraculous stone ceiling, where birds flew among the stars, lay dismantled out in the open, below real stars. The real blackness beyond the floodlights so intense, it seemed to be coming apart like wet paper. The workers had first attacked the surrounding rock, a hundred thousand cubic meters carefully plotted, labeled, and removed by pneumatics, and soon the building of artificial hills. To free himself from the noise of the machinery, Avery listened for the river flowing past their bed, his head against the hull. He imagined clinging to the dark wind, the steady breath of glass blowers in the city 500 kilometers north, the calls of water sellers and soft drink vendors, the shrieking of kingfishers through the surf of ancient palms, each sound evaporating into the desert air where it was never quite erased. The Nile had already been strangled at Saad El Ali, and its magnificent flow had been rerouted before that to increase the output of Delta cotton to boost the productivity of the unimaginably distant Lancashire mills. Avery knew that a river that has been barraged is not the same river, not the same shore, nor even the same water. And although the angle of sunrise into the great temple would be the same, and the same sun would enter the sanctuary at dawn, Avery knew that once the last temple stone had been cut and hoisted 60 meters higher, each block replaced, each seam filled with sand so there was not a grain of space between the blocks to reveal where they'd been sliced, each kingly visage slaughtered into place, that the perfection of the illusion the perfection itself would be the betrayal. If one could be fooled into believing he stood in the original site, by then subsumed by the waters of the dam, then everything about the temple would have become a deceit. And when at last, after four and a half years of overwork, of illness caused by extremities of heat and cold, or by the constant dread of miscalculation, when he stood at last with the ministers of culture, the 50 ambassadors, his fellow engineers, and 1,700 laborers to gape at their achievement, he feared he might break down, not with triumph or exhaustion, but with shame. Only his wife understood that somehow Holiness was escaping under their drills, was being pumped away in the continuous draining of groundwater, would soon be crushed under the huge cement domes. That by the time Abu Simbel was finally re-erected, it would no longer be a temple. The river moved, slow and alive through the sand, a blue vein along a pallid form flowing from wrist to elbow. Avery's desk was on deck. When he worked late, Jean woke and came to him. He stood up and she didn't let go, hanging from her own embrace. Calculate me, she said. At 
dusk, the light was a fine powder, a gold dust settling on the surface of the Nile. As Avery took out his paints from the wooden box, thick cakes of solid watercolor, his wife lay down on the still warm deck. Ceremoniously, he parted her cotton shirt from her shoulders, each time witnessing her body's color deepening, sandstone, terracotta, ochre, a glimpse of the secret white stripes under straps, the pale ovals like dampness under stones untouched by the sun, the secret paleness he would later touch in the dark. Then Jean peeled her sleeves from her arms and turned on her side, her back to him in the velvet light, the light of darkness, more evening than day. Avery leaned overboard, dipped his teacup into the river, then set the circle of water next to him. He chose a color and let it seep into the soft hair of the brush, infused with river water. Gently, he released its fullness across Jean's strong back. Sometimes he painted the scene before them, the riverbank, the ruinous work that never stopped, the growing pile of stone physiognomy. Sometimes he painted from memory the Chiltern Hills until he could smell his mother's lavender soap in the fading heat. He painted beginning from childhood until he was again man grown. Then, almost the moment he finished, he dipped the cup again into the river and with clear water drew his wet brush through the fields, through the trees, until the scene dissolved, a wash on her skin. Some of the paint remained in her pores until she bathed, the Egyptian river receiving the last earth of Buckinghamshire in its erasing embrace. Of course, Jean never saw his landscapes and blind was free to imagine any scene she wished. He would come to think of his wife's languor during that dusk hour, each dusk those months of 1964, as a kind of wedding gift to him. And in turn, she felt herself open under the brush as if he were tracing a current under her skin. In this dusk hour, each gave to the other a secret landscape. In each, a new privacy opened. Every evening that first year of their marriage, Avery contemplated Buckinghamshire, his mother's smell, the distance of time from the wet beach forest to this desert, stress points, fissures and elasticity, the pressure map of the soon to be constructed concrete domes, and the heavy <coughs> mortal beauty of his wife, whose body he was only beginning to know. He thought about the Pharaoh Ramses, whose body above his knees had recently vanished and now lay scattered in the sand, stored in a separate area from the limbs of his wife and daughters. It would be many months before they would be reunited, a family that had not been separated for more than 3,200 years. He thought that only love teaches a man his death, that it is in the solitude of love that we learn to drown. When Avery lay next to his wife, waiting for sleep, listening to the river, it was as if the whole long Nile was their bed. Each night he floated down from Alexandria through the delta of date palms, past isolated Dahabia with their loose sails beached on the banks. Each night before sleep, to dispel the day's equations and graphs, he made this journey in his mind. Sometimes, if Jean was awake, he spoke the journey aloud until he felt her drift into that state of near sleep when one still believes one is awake, hearing nothing. But Avery would continue to whisper to her nonetheless, elaborating the journey with a hundred details in gratitude for the weight of her thigh across his. The river, he felt, heard every word, wove every sigh into itself, until it was filled with dreaming, swelled with the last breath of kings, with the hard breathing of laborers from 3,000 years ago to that very moment.